There's Philip. He says, we are alive. I tell you, at home running the cameras for us. Amen? Amen. All right, well, it's so good to see y'all this evening, and uh, I'm excited about tonight's class. Man, this is one of my favorite parables. I've been applying it to my life for, I don't know, 25 years, I guess, and I uh, have seen the fruit of it. You know what I mean? So it's, we're going to be talking tonight about the parable of the talents. And uh, just to let you know, uh, those of you that are watching online, we'd love to have you here on Wednesday nights. Plenty of room to uh, social distance in the sanctuary, obviously. Uh, the children are down there going wide open. Uh, the youth are down there looking forward to a great night. Uh, we have uh, more classes that are going to be beginning soon. Um, we're going to be having uh, registration for classes uh, this Sunday for a new ladies class on Daniel. We're going to be finding out if we're ready to start the Sunday school hour. I know the numbers of COVID are going through the roof, but if it's here to stay, we got to find out how we're going to live in it. Amen? And uh, I don't know exactly what the sermon is going to be on Sunday, but God's given me the title. The year 2021, the year of lawlessness, what are we to do? What are we to do? How are we to be living? And let me tell you something, God's got the answers. Amen? Amen. All right, principles and prophecies in the parables. This is our third class, the parable of the talents. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord God, we thank you and praise you for this opportunity to come into your presence tonight. And Lord God, we're asking you to send the true teacher, the Holy Spirit of God, into this place. We're asking you to open our hearts and our minds to receive the truth of your word. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see and wisdom to apply that we can take your word and apply it to our lives and experience these secret truths that you are revealing to us through the parables, the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And we will be sure to give you all the honor, praise, and glory, for it is in the name of your precious Son, Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, just a quick review. Uh, we did study about how the purpose of the parables is to reveal the mysteries of the kingdom of God to those who have ears to hear and eyes to see. Uh, remember what a parable is. Um, it means to throw down something beside something else. And we know that Hebrews 11.3 says the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which you see were made of things that are invisible. And then Romans 1.20 says that God's invisible attributes can clearly be seen by what is made. In other words, God took a bunch of stuff we can't see, He made everything we can see, and He did it in such a way to reveal Himself. Amen? And so that's what parables are all about. It's about taking something natural, and you lay it down that runs parallel to something spiritual that you cannot see. For example, we're going to be doing uh, the parable of the talents, and here's how it begins. The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country. In other words, here it is, the kingdom of heaven, which you cannot see, here's what it looks like. It looks like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them, who were of his servants, that's you and I, amen, and to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. So it's just like the situation that we're in. The kingdom of God is like Jesus, okay, who is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, right? And he's gone away, and he's left you and I, his servants, in charge of certain things. Not only has he left us in charge of things, he's left us everything we need to carry out that great commission. Amen? Go therefore in all nations, making disciples of all nations. And then there's a specific call upon each one of you. Why? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. And God has given you the ministry of reconciliation. In some way, in some shape, in some form, some fashion, you are about evangelism to some degree. Whether you're supporting it, whether you're actually the one speaking, whether you've got a gift of helps, we're all to be taking care of the Father's business. Amen? And he gives you everything. Now, remember we did the parable of the sower last week. In the parable of the sower, it tells us that's a key to understanding all parables. So we're going to use a little bit of the example of the seed tonight too. Amen? All right. So 
To one he gives five talents, to another two, and to another one. And sometimes when you read that, you think, well, that guy with one talent didn't have much. Well, a talent was, and I put this in your notes for you, the largest unit of currency in the ancient world. It equaled 6,000 denarii, and one denarius represented one day's wages. Because a biblical work week is six days, then each talent represented 20 years' wages. So make numbers easy. Let's say a person made $50,000 a year. If you wanted to call that a year's wages, that'd be like giving one person $1 million, another person $2 million, and another person $5 million. So we're not talking about little bitty amounts of money here. Amen? And can I tell you that God has everything you need to carry on whatever God's called you to do. I'm talking about when you need something to fulfill His will, I'm talking about all it means is just one more zero put on there. I mean, really. He owns the earth, the fullness thereof. He can multiply things. I mean, look, five plus two, five loaves and two fish equal feeding 5,000 people. His math is not like ours. Amen? Okay. And I want you to notice this, that when he gave them these talents, he did not ask his servants to do anything they could not handle. And you know why we know that? Because he gave each one according, look at it, to his own ability. See, that's something different about our Lord, about our King, is he knows exactly what your ability is. But it's not just that. He gives you that ability. You know, there's an old saying that God does not always call the equipped, but he always equips the called. Where we get in trouble is when we get out beyond our calling, or we try to bite off more than... We can chew when we already know it's not by our might or our power, but by His Spirit. But when you're walking in His will, He never asks you to do something that you can't do because He's the one giving you the ability. You follow me? Okay. And then I put this at the bottom of the first page of your notes. Much like a seed. Let's go ahead and revisit that from last week. When we receive the Word, remember the sower sows the Word, right? When we receive the Word, Jesus Christ Himself, into our lives, it comes with a plan and everything we need to carry out that plan as we grow. Can I get an amen? But we do have to cooperate or respond to the growing process. See, and, and here's what I want you to, be, to see as we go through this too. This is just a picture of where they were at that time in their life. Okay? And we're going to look at this. You, how many of you know you can grow? A seed can grow, right? I'm talking about the fruit of the Spirit comes with maturity. See, when a person first gets saved, oh yeah, they begin to change, but they may still have a lot of anger issues. They may have, you know, they may have all kinds of stuff. They may not have any peace at all. And I mean, you know, long-suffering may be out the window. And I mean, there can be a lot of things wrong. Gifts will begin to operate. But when that fruit, that love, that joy, that peace, that long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, faithfulness is a big one we're going to be talking about tonight. See, those things you grow into. Amen? They become increased in your life. So I just want you, you're going to get more and more of that as we go along. But I want you to get down the idea that when this master gave to his servants one five talents, one two talents, one one talent. They were based on their own ability, so all they had to do was respond. Say respond. All right, you're going to get this as we go on. Here we go. Next two verses, we're on page two now, 16 through 18. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. Okay, so once again, the kingdom of God that you cannot see. Do you, know, you know what the kingdom of God we're talking about? Kingdom comes from two words, king and dominion. Amen? There's two kingdoms. There's a kingdom of the world and there's a kingdom of God. The kingdom of the world you can see the kingdom of God you cannot, but how many of you know that Paul tells us that the things we can't see are more real than the things we can? Okay? So the kingdom of God, once, a man, once again, is like this. You have three servants, 
Okay? And every servant has the same opportunity. The numbers are different, but the opportunity is the same. They were all given the responsibility based on their own ability. So what they really had was the ability to respond. Now I want you to get that in your mind. When we look at responsibility, we look at that, and, and what we're doing is we're responding. Responsibility literally means that you, you have this, this situation and you respond to it based on your ability. Okay, And we see that as a weight. Man, there's a lot of responsibility in raising a child. There's a lot of responsibility in keeping up a garden. There's a lot of responsibility in running a ministry. But when God's giving you the ability, what you really have is the ability to respond. That's all you've got to do. All you've got to do is listen to what He's telling you. Do what He says. If you have any doubt, hang on to your sure, especially the big things. Amen? And I'm talking about He has a plan for your life. Okay? All right. Two servants responded the call. See, God has a calling on your life. All you got to do is respond to it and walk in it now. And, and why is this so important? Because He loves you and He wants to have a relationship with you. That's what we're really talking about here. The calling upon your life and the commission that He gives us is a way to experience Him. How many of you ever seen God do something in your life? And buddy, you know it makes you feel so close to Him, right? Because you know that is God. Nobody else could have done that. There really is a God, and he really did do that. Amen? Okay. Two responded to the call, and one did not. What did he do? Instead, he, lit, he hid his Lord's money. And so, what is the picture there? Remember? Parable's a picture. So, you've got this king. He gives three servants things, and they all know they're supposed to do something with it. Right? I mean, obviously. Because the five, they, they take what God's given them. Let's just go ahead and call it what it is. They take what God's given them, and immediately they go to work, right? But one guy just goes on about his business, right? I mean, come on now, think about it. If, when you hide what God's given you, what are you doing? You're putting it somewhere, and you're going on about your life. How many times do we see that happen in people's lives? That God trusts them with something, and they just kind of... Listen, I've seen people have near-death experiences. This always, always puzzles me. And they'll have a near-death experience, and they'll go, Man, I know God spared my life, so He must have something for me to do. And I'll be like, Well, don't you think maybe you ought to figure out what that is? I mean, I have seen that so many times. People say, I know God's got more for me, and then just never give God another thought. It's the same thing that's happening here, folks. I'm talking about he just put the money to the side and went right on with his life, okay? And I put this in your notes. Two servants responded to the call, one did not. Instead, he hid his Lord's money and went on with life as usual. Just because he was responsible for less does not mean he had any less responsibility. We all have the responsibility to respond to God's call wherever we are with whatever we have. And then it's a growing process from there, okay? Colossians 3, 23 through 25 says this, and whatever you do, say whatever, whatever you do. I don't care if it's, if it's working in a restaurant, if it's running a business, working for a business, uh, going to school, uh, raising your whatever you do, do it heartily. Do it from your heart as to the Lord and not unto men. Because, see, actually, we're all serving Him if you're a believer. Amen? You're either serving the wicked one or you're serving the Lord. And if you're saved and you know Him and you've asked Him in your life, I'm talking about He's got a plan for you, right? So, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that from the Lord you will, say you will, not you might, I'm talking about you will receive the reward of the inheritance. How many of you know that it's impossible to please God without faith? For to please God, one must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder, say rewarder, of those who diligently seek him. Amen? All right. 
For you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But he who does wrong, okay, like the one who just took his talent and hit it, will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. In other words, I'm talking about it's not like God doesn't, God lets this one off the hook and doesn't let that one off the hook. Amen? I'm talking about, you know, there's no big eyes and little U's. Can I get an amen? Okay. So with that in mind, especially the part there is no partiality, the next two verses are this. Not, well, we're going to read a few verses here. 19 through 23. And it says, After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he gave them plenty of time. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for Jesus to come on back. Amen? But he gives you time, and after a long time, he comes. And I got news for you, he's coming. And whether he comes or you're like my little sister and you leave, you're going to end up standing before him. Amen? If you're saved, you go before the judgment seat of Christ. If you're not, you go before the white throne of judgment. But every one of us have this moment in our life where we're going to give an account of what we've done with it. Amen? So he who received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Now here we go. He who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. Well, you did good, but you didn't do quite as much as the guy with the five. So, no. He says this. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful. Say faithful. Faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. They both got the exact same reward. Why? Was it based on the outcome? That one of them preached to a million people and one of them preached to a hundred people? Was it based on one of them ran a multinational uh, ministry or ran a Sunday school class? No. They were faithful in whatever God called them to do. And there's not a human being alive that can't be faithful. It's not withheld from anybody. And God does it upon your ability, but what I want you to see is you can move too. We're going to get this in just a second, okay? As a matter of fact, um, I want you to see this. In your, in your notes, I put this down. I said uh, he, they received the same reward based on faithfulness and not on outcome. Do you remember what we looked at last week from 1 Corinthians? Some plant, some water, God gives the increase. So they didn't make that increase anyway. All they were was faithful. All they were were people who did whatever God told them to do and let him lead the way, and he made it grow. He brought the increase, right? All right, now we begin to see a principle. Remember, we're talking about principles and prophecies. My friend, this parable has both. The prophecy is, is that one day, if we'll just be faithful, well, whatever God has given you at this moment, Wherever you are in life, we have a young lady back here with us that she's in her teenage years. Whatever God has trusted her with at her age, or maybe some of us who are older that have had more time, whatever you have at that time, if you're faithful in it, I'm talking about that's what God is looking for. Amen? And you will enter into the joy of the Lord. There is a, I don't know about you, but could you imagine God actually saying, well done? Can you imagine living your whole life I mean, listen, I can remember graduating high school. That was pretty cool. Amen? You know, I, I remember watching my daughter when she went to graduation at college. I thought, that, that's great. Weddings are great. But I'm talking about when God says, well done. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Anyway, amen? I mean, I want to hear them six little words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Amen? Okay. But here's the principle. Remember what a principle is. When you do this, this is going to happen. Okay, it doesn't matter whether you believe it, whether you know about it, it's going to happen. It's like whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. So if a man sows corn, he's going to reap corn. 
If he sows an apple seed, he's not going to get a peach. Amen? If you do something good, you're going to get something good. You do something bad, you're going to get something bad. All right. This is a principle, and you see it begin to develop. And I put this in your notes. And here's what I want you to see. With every privilege comes responsibility. Okay? Anytime you have a privilege, it comes with a responsibility. And with every responsibility fulfilled comes more privilege. Here's two talents. I accept the responsibility. You give me the increase. Now I have four talents. He says, I will make you ruler over many things. You don't think that's going to carry more responsibility? You were faithful over a few things. Now I'm going to make you ruler over many things. You were faithful over a few things. Now I'm going to give you more responsibility. And if you accept that responsibility, then I'm going to give you another privilege. And with that privilege, it's going to take more responsibility. It's like a wheel that turns. Okay, if... If I'm renting an apartment and I don't pay my rent, nobody's going to mortgage me a house, right? If I have a job, maybe I don't like it much, but if I don't come to work, I would not look for them to give me that promotion, okay? It it applies to all of life, okay? I'm talking about every privilege has a responsibility with it, and it leads to another, another privilege, amen? Privilege, responsibility, privilege, responsibility, and it's like a wheel that turns that you can go through life. Amen? Okay. Like I said, whatever God has trusted in you with at that time. All right. Whenever people, I'll give you an example. You know, there's a a ministry uh, that I began many years ago. And uh, when I say many years ago, 25 years ago was really the birth of it. It became official maybe over 20 years ago called Parents with a Purpose. Out of Parents with a Purpose, we began Good Samaritan Health Center. So it actually grew out of Parents with a Purpose, literally. Parents with a Purpose sowed the first seed, the board of directors split, and we started Good Samaritan. Also out of Parents with a Purpose started Livingstone Church. Literally, Parents with a Purpose, we called it Family Day. It was really the beginning of that church, which came here and merged with OBT, Okay. And when people ask me if I ever share with somebody about this principle, I'll usually start with, uh, with what took place when Parents with a Purpose began out here. In other words, at first we started doing benevolence and we used my basement at my house. Okay? Then, as it began to grow, you know a lady, she's down there teaching right now, called Got Beef down in Building 7, Lori Meredith. Lori Meredith had a little bit larger house, so she had a bigger basement, so we moved into her basement. Then after we were faithful for a little while, a person who owned an apartment community, we were helping a lot of people that lived in their apartments, says, you know what, I got a building and you can have the whole bottom floor. So then we move in there and I think there was like 6,000 square feet. Well, then the ministry kept growing, so I'm over here at um, Old Belmont Hill Shopping Center so we rent out a slot at Belmont Hills Shopping Center. So we would pull everything out of that basement, go over there in the summer, do all these back-to-school outreaches. And then one year, I'm thinking, man, this thing's going to be too big for this slot. I'm standing there talking to the guy who's going to rent me this slot. And I said, I don't think that slot's going to be big enough. And another man's walking by me, and here's the conversation. He says, I got 50,000 square feet behind here, and I heard what you were saying, and I grew up in a single-parent home you can use that warehouse for free. So we move in there, right? Well, then this company begins to grow, and then he and his partner split, and they each have a warehouse, and they told me we could have both warehouses. So now we got two warehouses. Okay, we were dragging stuff around on little dollies. Now we're driving uh, forklifts until Philip crashed one into a big rack and about killed himself. But anyway, so I mean the thing, right? But you know when it really started? You know when the benevolent ministry really started? I had gotten saved during the night. The next day I went to my first church service. And uh, it was just me and the Holy Spirit and a Bible in a prison cell. A jail cell at that time. And I went to my first church service. And I came back in. And I was sitting there eating crackers. And God told me to go give a man one of my crackers. And then I ended up giving him a whole pack of crackers. That's when it began. 
It began giving a man in a jail cell a pack of crackers, if you want to know the truth, in God's eyes. Okay? Wherever you are, whatever you have at that time, if you'll just do what God tells you to do. And I'll never forget it. God said, go give that man a pack of crackers. I don't know if you've ever done time, but I was like, I can't go give that man a pack of crackers. He's going to think I'm funny. But anyway, it worked out really good. He ended up being in the Bible study and got saved over that pack of crackers. Okay? Listen, I was teaching on this one time, and uh, this was years ago, and Sharon Wright sitting right there. I was talking about how we can all do something with what we got. So we were going into the youth detention center every Tuesday night. I'm working 72 hours a week uh, running the dry cleaners plus doing ministry, right? Because I'm in this process of growing and being faithful. And she comes over with some homemade baked cookies that her and Elena right there and her two sisters baked. Well, when they came over to the dry cleaners, they were still hot cookies. They were like these chocolate chip cookies. So I go walking into the youth detention center, and the smell of those cookies started going down those hallways with all those cells in them. Buddy, when they opened up for church call, every kid in there came out to church. (laughs) Boy, they was wanting one of them cookies. Amen? Come on now. All right. Here we go. Here we go, but now let's, let's see what happens when we refuse to respond, okay? Matthew 25, 24 through 25. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, now there's a lot going on here for a short verse of Scripture. And this is when you really get into the parables because every parable is a picture. Every picture is worth what? A thousand words. So this could apply to so many situations. Like you really, okay, you'll, you'll see, look. Then he who received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown. See, you're not supposed to be able to reap where you hadn't sown. Amen? So there's something special about this Lord, right? Reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. In other words, I didn't use faith. Instead, I had fear, right? Right? And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. Now, how did he say that? Did he say, I'm so sorry. Look, here's what's yours. Or did he say, I knew you to be a hard man. You asked too much. I'm talking about nobody can live up to your expectations. So look, there, there's what's yours. I don't owe you anything. I call this account settled. What was his attitude? We don't know. It could have been any of those. See, that's the thing about the parables. You can read a parable and you can see it in one person and then you can see it in another and next thing you know, you see it in yourself. You follow me? How do we know? We don't really know what his attitude was when he was saying those things. But I've seen people call God a hard man. I've seen people say, man, I... I don't want any part of that. As soon as you talk to them about changing anything in their life, all of a sudden that's unreasonable when they wouldn't even have a life if it wasn't for God. I'm talking about God tells us that His yoke is light and His burden is easy, and it is. It really is. Why? Because He trusts you with something. He gives it to you because you ain't got anything. Then He gives you the ability to respond, and all He's wanting is a walking, talking relationship. All he wants to do is show you how faithful he is while you're being faithful to him. All he wants to do is show the world how much he loves them. John, first John tells us the only reason we love God is he first loved us. Nothing hard about him. But how many times have you seen people act like God's hard? Man, I, I remember one time I heard someone teaching on giving. And this guy goes, boy, God sure is greedy. I remember I scooted my chair back. I thought, man... If Jesus were to show up right now, I don't even want to be around this dude. You wouldn't have anything without him, right? But you see it in people, right? Okay, and think about this. Okay, well, let, let's go on and let's, let's take a look at what he says next, okay? And here's what his Lord says to him. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant. Now, I kind of hit on this on Sunday, and that's why I wanted to teach on the parable of talents. Wickedness, you know, in our eyes very often we think of some overtly act that we can see in front of your face, right? Some, you know, horrible thing that people go out and do, right? Maybe some guy that's like, 
you know, enslaving women or something, something like that. But in the eyes of God, man, wickedness is a little bit, is, can be a little bit different. Amen? And one of the things that's wicked is when God offers you a blessing and you count it as common or a trivial thing. I mean, he gave the man 20 years' wages. Now, how would you like to have that seed to start a ministry, Brother Jerry? Huh? 20 years' wages to start your ministry. I mean, I'm talking, he ain't starting with a pack of crackers in a jail cell. Okay? And I'm talking about, and treats that as common, like, oh, that'd be too much of a hassle. Let me tell you, just like King Ahab, God allowed him to become king of the nation of Israel, and he counted it a trivial thing to walk in the ways of Jeroboam. I'm talking about, man, that's wickedness in the eyes of God. Okay? What about when God offers salvation to someone and they act like there's nothing to it? Come on now. Same thing. Okay? He says, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew I reap where I have not sown, so you know that I'm not like everybody else. And I gather where I have not scattered seed. You ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. In other words, think about it. He could have taken that, gone down here to regions, sat down. He would have taken a little while. He had to open up an account, and he'd have had to do a little research. It might have taken him a half a day, right? See, but he hid it. What is the picture there? You just put it in the backyard. If you dug in the ground, you just go out there. Instead of going down the bank, you just go out there and well, throw it in there, cover it up. When he comes back, you don't even get out of your house, probably, out of your yard. Mm -mm -mm -mm. And at my coming, see, everybody could do something. Amen? Okay. So, let, let me just go ahead. Let's go on down. So, here, I want you to see this too, because this is important to see. All right, let's go on down. I'm on page five now. I think I pretty well covered everything else. You know, I, well, I gave you some good examples. Well, let me give you an example. The point is, is that when God extends his blessings and we shun the offer, do you know what it means to shun something? It means you turn your back on it. That's what shunning means. So he makes an offer of salvation and you turn your back on it and walk off. Okay? And I give you some examples, okay? For example, okay, children are a gift from the Lord. Right? The Bible tells us that. Psalms 127.3 tells us that they're a gift from the Lord, man. All right? And when we shun the responsibility for caring for them, it's a very serious thing. Or what if God offers you the gift of a child and you abort it? Okay? I'm talking about it's more serious than people think. Whether it be your family, a job, a ministry, they are all opportunities and blessings from the Lord and should not be taken lightly. Here's what I want you to see is that when you understand... <clears throat> That when God gives you a, a responsibility, that if you'll accept it, then you have another privilege. All of a sudden you realize that every responsibility is just an opportunity. Right? It's not a weight, it's an opportunity. And see, here's the thing. In the world, people can see principles like this in the world. Because they're there. Like my father was not a Christian. He never said, whatever a man sows, that shall also reap. But my dad noticed something. He says, you know, son, whatever goes around comes around. He just noticed that. You know, he just noticed that if you're generous with people, for some reason you're never broke. If you're greedy, it seems like, you know, you never have anything. He just saw these things. Treat people kind, people will treat you kind. Do people right, people will do you right. I mean, he just saw it happening around him, right? Well, see, the world sees this, <clears throat> and what can happen to a person in the world is they become driven. Because they're trying to do it by their might and their power. In other words, they see that if I accept this responsibility, then there's a privilege that comes after, and they think that somehow or another, if they can climb their way to the top of the corporate ladder, they'll be happy. And so they start trying to ride this thing that I'm talking about, but they're doing it out of their own power, and they become exhausted. They become worn out. They become workaholics. They start losing their family. They start losing their marriage because, see, they're doing it by their own might and by their own power. Whereas God, the kingdom of God you can't see, He wants to give you the ability to do... See, 
Once again, before I got saved, I was in an illegal business, okay? I knew if I worked hard at it, I could grow in that illegal business, but then God would step in and just take it all. I mean, I knew it was God. Didn't know who he was, didn't know how to be saved, but I knew it wasn't normal. I mean, I'm talking about really. He used to mess with me when I was out there running against the wind. So people can see it, but they don't understand how to really operate in it and apply it. It's not a joy unless you're doing it in the Lord. Okay, if you're trying to do it with it, and I don't care if you're doing ministry. If you start trying to do ministry by your own power, you will become burnt out quick. If all of a sudden you start looking around, I had someone share this with me. If you, he was talking about how sometimes he shared wonderful things God has done with other ministers. And they start getting jealous and angry, okay? Well, I got news for you. The only reason it's not happening for them is they're not being faithful in some kind of area, okay? And if God calls, calls you to lead this size church, then you want to lead that size church. If he teaches you, if he wants you to teach a Sunday school class and work a job, you teach that Sunday school class. And the reward's going to be the same. Well done. Good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Okay? But now I want you to see how this thing can also go backwards on you. I want you to get this now. It'll go backwards on you. Look what happens to this guy. Matthew 25, 28 through 29. I'm on page 5. So, that means because this guy did what he did and hid that money in the ground. So, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given. Okay? And he will have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. So he who has been faithful is going to have an abundance. He who has not, now he's going to lose what he has. Okay. So God, and I, I gave you some examples. For example... A person may have the privilege of an automobile. An automobile is a privilege, right? But he doesn't accept the responsibility of caring for it. I just, man, we just went and had Danny's battery changed in her car today. You know what it costs to have a battery changed in a car today? $267. The labor, because the crazy battery is not under the hood anymore. They got to go back there and take something apart in the back. And the battery was like, I'm like, you know, I remember them days when you used to, you know, go down and buy yourself a little alternator and put it on a car with two bolts. Well, those days are gone, aren't they? So if you have an automobile, I, got prom I promise you, you're going to have some responsibility. You're going to have to pay insurance. You're going to have to put gas in it. You're going to have to take care of it. Amen? So if they don't accept the responsibility of caring for it, it breaks down. Now you can't get to work. Now you lose your job, and what are you doing? You're rolling backwards, okay? Or maybe a person, page six, wants the privilege of money, like a talent, without accepting responsibility and working for it, so he deals drugs or steals it. He tries to take a shortcut. I got news for you. Prisons are full of people trying to have privilege without responsibility, okay? What happens? Then you go to jail. What happens when you go to jail? You lose all your privileges, Right? But guess what? You don't have any responsibility either. When you're in jail, you don't have to pay rent. You don't have to buy groceries. You don't have to pay a power bill. But guess what? You don't get to choose what cell you're going to be in. You don't get to choose what you're going to eat. And you don't get to say when the lights go on and off. Why? Because you can't have a responsibility without a privilege. But I got news for you. You can't have a privilege without a responsibility either way. They go hand in hand. Do you see what I'm telling you? Okay. All kinds of people think they'll be happy if they could sit around and have someone sending them checks without accepting any responsibility. And it just doesn't work like that. Amen? Okay. The point is you cannot have a privilege without responsibility. You cannot have a responsibility without a privilege. This is good. I want to read it to you. It is a principle of life revealed to us by the creator of all things. Right? Who is Jesus? He is in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Word is God and was with God. Through Him all things were made. He made all this stuff. 
so that we can see the things that we can't see, right? You can either ride it or you can fight it, but I promise you, you will not win. Like I said, I tried. And you think you got this thing turned in your direction without accepting responsibility, and next thing you know, man, God just come and take it. Okay? Listen. You might as well get on, for to everyone who has and exhibited responsibility, more will be given and he will have abundance. This word abundance comes out of the Strong's Concordance. I just used that definition. And you know what it means? To superabound. Isn't that a strange word? I've never heard anybody really use that word. You don't just abound, you superabound. Okay? It means to have an excess. In other words, when you're faithful with God, look at what he did. He started out with 20 years wages to the little guy. I'm talking about you don't, if you're struggling, okay, look. If the ministries, and this is, this is amazes me, okay. Every January, it's almost like, I mean, I don't know how God deals with everybody, but it's like God's running on a calendar year with me. And every January, and I told Jerry Brooks back there, I could feel it. And guess what, Jerry, that day something happened. Something that blew my mind. Me and Danny were speechless for about 20 minutes. I'm talking about every January, everything that God has trusted me with goes to another level, okay? And it's been going on steadily for all these years. Well, COVID hits. Now, if COVID hit and everything didn't increase like it has been, it wouldn't surprise me because of COVID. But you know that everything has increased the same amount it increased in 2019 and the same percentage it increased in 2018. It's like it didn't even slow God down in any area. So if, especially now that COVID has happened and I see that God doesn't lit up one bit because of that, God speaks to you through this. If all of a sudden you're running short for everything, you know what you do? Dear Father in heaven, Lord God, what's going on? What's going on? What do I need to do? Because I know you're not lacking and I know your kingdom's not lacking. You know, why? You know if you go to the book of Malachi, you know, in the book of Malachi, the people are asking God, don't you love me? Because he starts out by going, I have loved you. Well, why are they asking God if he doesn't love them? Because all of a sudden they're suffering financially. Why do you think God uses, God uses money in a lot of parables. You know why? Because where your treasure is, your heart is. So it's a great way for God to give you an example. All he's talking about here is being faithful with your heart. See, those guys with those talents, when they got them, they said, man, I'm going to go out and do something for my Lord. Look, Lord, what I did. I had two talents, now I got four. I had five, now I got ten. One of them says, I'm not doing anything for the Lord, and he puts it in the ground. Okay? I'm talking about where was his heart. His heart wasn't with the Lord, was it? The other two were excited to go to work, and they were excited to report what had happened. They were excited. I guarantee they were giving God glory all the way through the whole thing. Amen? Okay. So, it means to excel, to surpass. In other words, if all of a sudden the manna quits falling, see, God doesn't even need five loaves and two fish. He can put you out in the desert and manna will fall. Okay, so when, when that pillar of fire by night began to move, or that pillar of cloud by day began to move, if you thought, man, I just got my tent set up, I, man, my wife's just had a baby, I'm talking about, I don't want to pull up my tent and go and you were to stay there. Do you think any manna would have been there the next morning? No. It wouldn't have been there. So you'd know, you know what, I better get up and get back where God wants me to be because I don't have anything here. Do you remember what happened to Peter? Peter was so frustrated, he went back to fishing. Remember what happened? He couldn't catch anything. Okay, so God speaks to us through provision, folks. If God's not providing, you need to ask why. Because He is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. And so sometimes He'll use finances to slow you down. You need to wait a minute. Okay, like I, I always say this. I think that interest is the worst thing that ever happened to the churches. Because you don't need it. In other words, loans, mortgages. You don't need those. Okay, in churches and stuff, you're getting ahead of God if you've got to go do that. Like Good Samaritan Health Center. When we started building that, God put it on my heart to start that thing. I said, Lord, there's no one church going to do this vision. We're talking millions of dollars a year doing health care. The whole United States of America can't do it. So if it's going to be your deal, then it's got to be your bill 
because I don't have the money. And so we built that thing, and I remember guys on the board said, man, we better get a revolving in line of credit, man. We got this thing going. And I, I told them, I said, we ain't going to need it, but you can get it if you make you feel better. They went and got it. We've never used it. You know how we know when we're in, when, when, you know how we know when we need to pray and start seeking God? Anytime our bank account gets less than a million dollars. When it gets less than a million dollars, we all go, well, we need to start figuring out what we need to be doing. We're not in trouble. You don't have to make any emergency decisions. It's just we're down below there. So, Lord, what do we need to do? Do we need to talk to some people? Do we need to revisit some people? Do we need to take a look at what's going on and make sure we're not being wasteful? Just show us what we need to do, God. Okay? I'm talking about when Obamacare came into action, we thought, well, God, are you through with this ministry? Because our ministry, Good Samaritan, the only people that we reached out to were people with no insurance. Okay? That's all we see. And when Obamacare came out, we thought, well, if everybody's going to have insurance, maybe you don't need us anymore. God, do you need us anymore? And so we started praying. Because if you don't, it's okay. I don't care. I could care less. When I see people just driving themselves crazy, trying to keep a dead ministry alive, what are you doing? If God isn't breathing life into it, let it go. Okay? I mean, I don't pre- you can sit there and try to resuscitate a dead horse all day. He's going to stink. So it's fine with us. We'd all just go do something else because God's got plenty to do. When I see people like they're trying to get God to bless what they're doing, I'm going, man, you got this thing backwards. You be faithful in what God's calling you to do right now and just ride it. Ride that wave. Amen? So the, the quick trip building down there, right down here at Good Samaritan, it was a quick trip in front of them. They moved down to the corner of um, South Cobb Drive and Austell Road. So there's this little quick trip building sitting there. We were built behind it. And so we asked them, if you ever sell that quick trip building, we'd like to buy it. And uh, so they said, well, you know, we want $800,000 for it. We said, well, we'll give you like three fifty. And they started laughing like, you know, we're a healthy company. We don't need, you know, we'll just wait. We'll get our money for it. And okay. So when this Obamacare thing happened, all of a sudden we're asking God, do you even need us anymore? Okay, all of a sudden, we got a letter that because of electronic medical records that we had been like number one, number two, number three in America, all right, of showing how much we really help people. And then also, we keep really good records of people making sure they really need help. So there's something called a fairly qualified health center, and it's because they can look at it on electronic medical records. And they said, we've deemed you to be a fairly qualified health center. We're only number two in America that's overtly Christian because our, our mission statement is to spread the love of Christ. That's what it is, okay? So here's the government, okay? Now, this as soon as we're asking, do you want to shut it down? They said, we're going to make you a fairly qualified health center, and because you're ministering to the neediest of the needy and you're doing it with excellence, any doctor that wants to do their internship there, we're going to knock $50,000 a year off their school loan. Any dentist that wants to do their internship there, we're going to knock $50,000 a year off the school loan. I mean, I'm talking about doctors just beating the door down, won't come volunteer, right? And then they said it also comes with a $1.2 million gift. Well, the first thing I said was, well, does it come with any strings attached? Because we don't want it if it does. And so we could, because we never took government funding, ever. But it's not based on future. If you take a government grant for something, they will not want you to share the gospel and things because that's not what government money's for. Because that's what you're doing in the future. They said, no, no strings attached. This is not something that you're going to use in the future. It's a reward for past. So no strings attached. So we're thinking, you know, is that God? Then all of a sudden, quick trip called two days later. Says, hey, we've decided that we'll take three hundred fifty thousand dollars for that property, and the guy said he don't even know where the words came from. He says, we'll give you two fifty. So we bought that thing, cash money. Now we had the first Christian mental health department that I know of. Okay, and now we're about to join two campuses together and expand. All God never borrowed one dime. Okay, I'm talking about our God does not need a mortgage. He guides and directs you. You get out ahead of him when you start having to borrow money. What does the Bible say? The borrower is slave to the lender. God's people, and the Son makes you free, you're free indeed. 
Now, I'm not saying that if you got a mortgage on your house, you committed a sin. What I am telling you is he can help you get debt free and you don't have to live in debt. Because if you're in debt, you're running ahead of them. Because I'm talking about the manna is there. All right, we're coming in for landing. I'm getting carried away. So here's the, here's the ultimate rejection right here at the bottom of page 6. This is the last verse of Scripture in this parable. He says, And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this is the ultimate warning. How many times a day is God offering the gift of salvation, which he paid for himself, and he's going to give you the faith, and he even gives you the faith to believe it. It tells you that in Romans, right? You're saved by grace through faith. And in Romans 12, 3, it tells you that God's given you a measure of faith. It's like the talent. He's provided the sacrifice. He's giving you the faith, everything you need, right? And you don't respond to it. Well, there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it's not like God's saying, well, if you don't work for me, then you're going to... No, you don't lose your salvation because you don't work for God, okay? But I got news for you. It says that you have been saved by grace through faith, that not of yourselves. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. For you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, okay? So when a person is really saved... You have the desire to do something. Whenever you're saved, you want to do something for the Lord just as natural as a peach tree grows a peach. You do not have to convince a peach tree to grow a peach. It is the nature of the peach tree to bear fruit. So if you have no desire to serve God, I would say this person right here is one of those that rejected salvation and the gift altogether. Just my opinion. Amen? And you know what Hebrews says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And I just put at the end of your notes, may we all answer the call. May we all respond to the call. Amen? All right, I'm going to bless everyone that's with us online. If you guys got any comments or questions, we'll stay and talk a few minutes. But I just want to bless you right now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May your days be free from fear, and may you be blessed with the spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind all the days of your life. As a deer panteth for the water, so may you long for him. May God bless you with a hunger for his word, for he just told us that those of you who have it, more will be given. May he give you a thirst for righteousness, a desire for understanding that you can have more on top of what you have. I pray that God bless you with the courage to let your light shine, that when men see your good works, which God has called you to do and provided everything you need, you'll do it in such a way that they will glorify your Father in heaven. Now may God bless everything you touch that brings glory to his name. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Amen.